Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Ellen Fanning, coming to you from far north Queensland and the city of Cairns, a place not without its challenges. COVID has all but wiped out tourism here. The reef is under threat. And as anyone in this place will tell you, the countdown is on for the end of the economic lifeline, JobKeeper. But as you'll hear from our panel of far north Queensland locals, it's not all bad news. So what are the bright ideas that are cutting through the economic clouds? Welcome to my office. Joining me on the panel this afternoon, Samara Jose is born and bred in Cairns and founded Deadly Inspiring Youth Doing Good, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporation. Wonderful to see you in person. Great yes. to meet you. Yes, and you too. Our former ABC correspondent, Martin Cudahy, who left the Africa office for Cairns but now works, wait for it, on a cattle property. Is that a tree change, a paddock change? What is that? Uh, it's a very much a life change, Ellen, that's yeah. for sure. Good for you. Topaz McCall, the front's 15 times better, a consultancy which helps link Indigenous affairs programs with employers. Wonderful to see you in person. Thanks, Ellen. And also joining me, former state LNP member for the area, Michael Trout, who runs a quad bike and horse riding operation called Blazing Saddles! Exclamation mark. G'day, Michael. Thank you very much. <laughs> And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag the drum. After the Prime Minister's yesterday kicked off the vaccination rollout, Queensland's first shots began today with a Gold Coast based nurse and a police inspector, being the first 180 in the state to receive the vaccine. 12 months on, we are now here celebrating the arrival of a vaccine that can help us get back to what we've enjoyed in this state and in this country, which is out and about in our communities, have our, our economy fully open. And it's that promise of greater movement between the states which will be crucial for the survival of towns like this. This is the gateway to the rainforest and the reef. Cairns has a population of about 150,000, but currently around one third of the workforce is on JobKeeper because with COVID, came the virtual end of international tourism and a severe cut in domestic travel on which much of this town relies. The date marked in everyone's calendar here is March 28, when JobKeeper is due to run out. The ABC's Alan Kohler has this take on the particular problems in Cairns' future. When JobKeeper finishes, if nothing else is done, Cairns will become a ghost town or a retirement village. 22,000 people are relying on JobKeeper at the moment. That's about a third or more than a third of their workforce. And the whole town really relies on international tourism. And, you know, it's, it's not coming back at the end of March. So um, I think the place is in strife. You know, taxi drivers, doctors, restaurateurs, everyone really in, in town relies on the tourism. So they'll have to go somewhere else if, uh, you know, if the JobKeeper doesn't continue. So the only people who could stay there, it seems to me, would be those on a government pension. So, you know, uh, people who have retired. Cairns would shrink dramatically, I think. And I, look, I see Cairns as a test case, really. It's not the only place that relies on international tourism and, and would be in trouble with the loss of JobKeeper. But a part of the problem with Cairns is that it's so far away from the rest of the country that you, you have to fly there, you can't really drive there. So it's not much of a candidate for domestic tourism, which other places like Warrnambool and the Great Ocean Road and so on are. So Cairns is really isolated for that reason. And I, and I think it's a test case really for the rest of us. Are we gonna leave this place behind? Because you know the rest of the country, the rest of the economy is booming out of recovery. I mean, the construction sector is absolutely booming. House prices are up. Employment is almost back to where it was. So the rest of the economy is fine. But just this international tourism is, is gonna go away for uh, at least 12 months, possibly two years, gradually coming back. And that's a very awkward time. I mean, if an industry is completely stuffed and has to close, such as the car industry uh, back in 2010-11, you know, everyone who worked for that car industry had to go find another job because, you know, that was never coming back. But here we've got th these tourism industries in North, far north Queensland, they will come back. It's a $45 billion industry for Australia, so we really want it to come back. But uh, when the tourists arrive in a couple of years' time, there has to be someone there. 
I think the government needs to think about this. How do we preserve Cairns for two years? Alan Kohler there. Samara, let's start with you. I mean, you're a notoriously upbeat person mm -hmm. and thrilled to be sitting beside you here. But um, I feel a, a, a real fear in this town about the end of JobKeeper. Is that right? 100%. 100%. You know, we have lots of young people that are really dependent on the tourism industry. It's, it's that entry-level kind of um, job that they need to be able to kick, get their kickstart in life. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they're not going to get that if our industry does. You know, we have a young person in our, in our own network who potentially may not have a job at the end of it. Um, what does he do? He's been in tourism for his whole young life yeah. um, since he graduated school. So, so where does he go? He's, he's got nothing. Mm. Um, it, he ends up coming to our office and goes, you need to find me a job. You need to make me a job. You mm. need to do something because otherwise it means, well, what does, if he can't get a job in Cairns, where does he go? Mm. He goes away from family. He goes away from what he knows and where he's most safe and where he's most comfortable. Um, that's, that's a really hard thing to do. And that's a hard thing to force a young person to do, especially when they're trying to figure out where they fit in this, you know, in this space. You've come up today, uh, Martin, from uh, a property outside of Charters Towers. That's right. Um, is, is there a different sentiment when you go into Charters Towers? I mean, beef prices are high, things are going okay. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it is, it is very different there. People are actually pretty upbeat. Um, uh, I feel a bit bad saying it yeah. while we're here in Cairns, but that is the case. People are um, experiencing highs in that price of beef that they haven't in a generation. So there really is a sense of optimism. But that is a complete contrast to when you come to Cairns. You know, just on the way here, I was speaking to the taxi driver and, and he, was, he was saying that he's probably going to move to Townsville because he, he, was, he couldn't find any work. Well, he was after the end of this month, he was confident that his work would be pretty much dried up completely. So there is a, a real sense of pessimism, I believe. And I'm just surprised, really, that, you know, as Alan said, this is an industry that's worth more than $40 billion, that no decision has been made prior to this. You know, what have we got, a month to go? I, yeah. think, it's, I think it's a little bit surprising, really, that there hasn't been more action taken at this stage. Mm. And we're, we're going to talk, Topaz, throughout this hour about a whole range of issues, including a really deep dive into that issue of JobKeeper's going to end, what next? Um, you are a person who makes jobs for other people and you're very successful at it. W what are your feelings about the future of Cairns? Yes, I think um, having grown up here and knowing, you know, there's only a couple of main industries that have sustained the paradise that we live in, this idea that people could relocate as easily as some is also something that I don't think people have actually thought through. Uh, and if you've got 10,000 people who turn up on Monday at Centrelink, uh, what does that do to the system itself? If and they so, all ended up on JobSeeker. Mm. Yeah, so how about we try and invest it sustainably with a more tailored target approach um, as opposed to a one-size-fits-all, and I think the outcomes would be incredible. But it has to be a bridging solution, knowing that this is, it will come back, the industry, um, but to leave this area is just not on anyone's radar. Mm. Mm. Michael, I was speaking to a shopkeeper. You walk past empty shop after empty shop, just in this arcade through here, let alone in town, you know, all the, all the big expensive shops that are here, presumably, for the international tourists. And one woman said to me, you know, if someone had said to me a year ago, not going to be any better, you know, it's not going to be any better at the end of February, she said, I don't know whether I would have stayed. What would you have done a year ago? Well, the shops and the hotels and restaurants tell the story of Cairns. I've been a veteran of the tourism industry for the past 30 years and we've never seen uh, a hurdle like this one. Uh, and we need, we need a, a bridging, as Topaz just said, of two years before uh, the vaccines rolled out and international tour tourists uh, can come back to Cairns. A lot of people uh, that are watching tonight won't realise how far away we are from Brisbane. Yeah. Cairns sits 1,700 kilometres. That's not 700, that's 1,700 kilometres. <laughs> Uh, from Brisbane. We're closer to Port Moresby than we are to Brisbane. So for people to come here, it must be by aviation. And, uh, but what we do have is we are very, very close to a lot of international countries like Japan, uh, like Singapore, uh, countries that have a lot of people that can either come through those gateways and into Cairns. But, uh, so there's a two-year gap and we, we're not just an international market. Our school holiday periods of Christmas and Easter uh, and through the, the winter months is incredible. The, we, we're fully booked uh, by our southern 
uh, states, Sydney, mm. uh, Victoria and New South Wales. And uh, we do need to get that better. We've, we've made sure that Australia is safe uh, with COVID, mm. but we now need to make sure that our economy is safe. And mm. it's a loose word economy, but it's jobs, it's people's lives. And, and, uh, and if we don't get that right, there is gonna, that we're gonna be, uh, there's gonna be a pandemic mm. in this area. And uh, so I hope that people okay. that do listen take that on board. Yeah, just real quick, Samara, when you see the jabs going into people's arms and you know there's vaccine here in Cairns, mm -hmm. is that exciting? It is and it isn't. Yeah. You know, I think you go, yes, that may mean something for our industry and, and jobs, but you also still get that little bit of nervousness and you go, what do I know about it? How oh, do yeah. I... Have you, commu uh, have you communicated, have you communicated it to, me? It to yeah. me in a way that I understand it? Uh, probably not. I just hear the, you know, the major headlines. Somebody's got a vaccine. OK. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be in line just yet. Uh, I might see what, how it all plays out, but... Um, Look, if it means if it means that I can help get a job for a young person, and it means that that's slave. things, <sighs> let's do this. You know, <laughs> like you never know. Coming up a little bit later uh, on the program, we join scientists as they check in on the ingenious experiments that ho they hope will keep the Great Barrier Reef alive. We want to look at how the trajectory of those sites go over time to say whether we're really having a good impact. Can you track and arrest your way out of a crime problem? That's the dilemma here and in places like Townsville and way down in Logan City in the southeast of the state. Unemployment, bored kids and social problems mean the issue of youth crime is constantly in the headlines. The state government has responded with new laws to be introduced into Parliament this week aimed at what they said are the 10% of repeat juvenile offenders. They will usher in things like GPS tracking devices for 16 and 17 year olds and reversing the presumption of bail for some offenders. But Queensland's Youth Justice Department report last year actually said the number of young people charged with offences was down 23% from the previous year and a small number were to blame for nearly half the youth crime. The drum Stephanie Bolchi spoke to some former offenders. Now you won't see their faces due to Queensland laws which prevent identification she also spoke to the mentors who helped them change their path. I got sentenced to the Cleveland Youth Detention Centre when I was 16. I got sentenced for obviously stealing cars, breaking enters. I was pretty young, around about the age of 12, when I started my first crime. It all started off as shoplifting started hanging around the wrong boys to the point they allowed me to follow them and they showed me how to break into houses steal cars uh, I just wanted to earn my reputation it's just like every other boys that goes in there they say it's safe you know you lose your freedom which is pretty much everything so and I got out and sort of looked for help which say <laughs> I haven't seen you all day. <laughs> My uncle, he runs a cultural training centre. He helped me heaps with, with just talking to us and counselling and keeping our mind off, off crime. Yeah, and work at it yourself. Yeah. Uh, didn't wait for any services to help you. I was locked up for a pretty long time. Went back in, but uh, at the age of 17, I really needed his help. And ever since then, he never gave up on me. And that's why they're now successful is because they've got a father figure in their life with direction and correction, discipline, but a lot of love as well. And the boys now call me father or they call me uncle. We started going down to Cleveland as a youth program in 2016. And it was myself and three other young people. All right, hello, Ms. Sylvia. Along the journey, we kind of invited our elders. That grew then into it being an elders program. So they absolutely loved doing the program in Cleveland. It was very daunting for me, seeing those children in lockdown, having to be locked away. When we go in there, it's a lot calmer. They're waiting for us when we get down there. And as we have yarning and hard talks, and exerting our older authority and commanding respect and talking to them, that we can open their eyes to see where, where they're doing that wrong. Because the elders know more about you know, identity and 
more about the structure of life that the young fellas are more willing to listen to you more than their parents. Obviously as a father now I wouldn't want my son doing what these other youths are doing so I guess that it all comes up to supervision and parenting. Would you rather live with your family and at the end of the day return to them or would you rather do 120 on the highway with coppers in your rearview mirror and possibly die? Leave that one up to you. And Stephanie Bolte reporting there. Samara, so I'll start again with you. I mean, uh, your organisation uh, does youth outreach, encourages leadership and community connection, positive mm -hmm. pathways mm -hmm. for young Indigenous people. How do you see this problem? Look, it, it, the way that the government is reacting is reactionary. You know, we, we know that those kinds of punitive measures don't work we, and we don't spend enough money in the actual preventative preventative spaces. We hear time and time again from young people, I'm bored, you know, that's there, there's what nothing do to say? do in community. What do they say? Is it Literally, boredom? Literally, it is, part of it is boredom. It's a space where they feel safe and they belong. I don't want to go home because I've got 15 people in my home. You know, where do I go and hang out and chill out and decompress all the things that is, you deal with as a young person? Um, you know, you're trying to figure out who you are. Uh, what you want to be, you're being forced to, to pick a career path, you know, all these kinds of things that are absolutely compounding all at once. Um, not to mention if you've got social issues going on, poverty, you know, lack of housing, uh, lack of employment from your, from your family, a lack of intergenerational wealth. Um, they're, just, they're just so compounding that young people don't even have a chance sometimes. Um, but we need, there are people out there people in our organisations who have a heart and they, and they absolutely love the work that they're doing when they have the ability to work with those young people and to support them through, okay, how do we, how do we slowly build? We've got to fix little bits of, it, of those, you know, the things that we need to fix. But they're all, it's, it never kind of gets down to what is really truly at the root cause of, of all these issues, you know. Youth crime is, is, a, is often, is just literally that. It's a, it's a, an outcome from these root cause issues, housing, employment, health, education, you know, and we're not putting enough money into those mm. frontline people that have the resources, that have the relationships with those young people, that have the ability to pull them back in, you know, pull them back into, into line. Um, our community and our culture is built on collectivism. It's, it's that collective identity that we as a, as a collective family group, as a collective group, you know, we need to belong somewhere. And if we're not getting the support to belong in somewhere positive, mm. and it doesn't exist in our community because the spaces where that, those things can be built isn't there, well, we're going to go and find places where, where we feel like we belong because somebody else is pulling us in. And it may not be the right thing, it may not be the right, you know, it's definitely might be the wrong choice, but I belong there. Yeah. I feel safe there. I feel like somebody's got my back, you know? Okay. Um, Michael, um, when you were in government, um, there was an effort to, to take kids and, and take them out bush. Um, now there's a discussion about putting GPS trackers on uh, teenaged ankles. Do you think that'll work? Well, it's a very complex issue, and, and while, I, while I agree that the issue is right at the grassroots of you know, families and, and everything else, there is only a small amount of offenders. And what I would like to talk about is the fact that you know, th there's so many victims out there and, and their cars are trashed or whatever else. If those 1 or 2 per cent are not allowed to re-offend time after time after again, it doesn't create this ability that you, you're part of a group because you know you one person stole and we've got to steal something bigger but, but how, how does it work because I mean if you've got a GPS tracker on your leg it doesn't stop the crime no, it just but means least, you were in vicinity of where a crime know, was committed you know, if you're not at home whatever that you know please could if they see if three or four of them together or something like that that could happen but I do believe that you know uh, our schools are doing a great job, uh, particularly in, in Cairns. A lot of kids are getting to school these days, but the ones that aren't, we've got to you know, make sure that there is a community effort behind that because education is a big deal. If you haven't got education, you can't get a job. Yeah, but just let's go to the pointy end of what those changes are going through Parliament today, or this week. How does that help? 
Is the notion that you've got about 400 offenders across the state who are problematic and if you just take them out of circulation and lock them up or put, a, put something on their leg, that'll solve the problem? Okay, well, one, one issue before the bracelet is breach of bail. If you have already offended and you've done something terrible and, and you're waiting for your court case and you've re-offended again in that time, you should have your bail taken off you like any other uh, state in this, in, this, in this nation. And that is the biggest single issue we have because, as I said before, there's only a few that are offending. And if those people are dealt with correctly, they, then there's a rehabilitation of that person as well. So I'm having a two-way bet here that we do have to help back in the family, back in the home situation, but when we've got someone that is re-offending and taking police time out, you know, there, there's vigilante stuff happening. Last night in Bentley Park in Cairns, uh, that some, uh, some young people put all garbage bins across the road to, j to jack a car. Now, that's someone pulling up, then they, they surround the car, open the door, pull someone out and get in and steal their car. Topaz, I mean, how, how, how do you see this? Do you think this crime crackdown out of the parliament in Brisbane will do anything? So I think we're just treating a symptom of a much larger problem. And so these are just behaviours which are at the end of um, a cycle, which are all of the things that um, both Michael and Tamara have both mentioned today. But I think it, for that percentage of people being so small, there needs to be rehabilitation in mind when it comes to especially kids who are 11, 12, 13, 14. It's very different if you're dealing with somebody who's 40 and is potentially re-offending. So if you look at other countries where crime rate has reduced 80%, it's because they've actually looked at these scenarios, especially where substance abuse is involved. It's actually a rehabilitation program versus let's just lock the kids up, throw away the key. But the system's breaking at the end where we've obviously got our frontline workers who are just there at the end. But it's all of the stuff that should be happening beforehand that I don't think there's much importance placed on it. There's no support mm -hmm. for organisations like Samara's or their big borrowing and stealing to get any type of funding. The amount of money, if you invested early on that, would be, you know, one hundredth of what we're paying mm -hmm. now when somebody actually ends up in the system. Um, and look, we're in a cycle now because unemployment's rising. Youth unemployment is one of the scariest things that's coming up. So you're just so. sorry? There's we're, we're, they've diverted traffic behind us today for the, for the course of the program, but you're saying that youth unemployment, is, there's a link there. Yeah, across the entire country, youth unemployment yeah. is a problem. So right. there is a problem and it's not because kids don't want to have work. There's just a multitude of reasons, mm -hmm. but we need to scale it back and actually just look at the basis of why kids are wandering the streets. There's been some phenomenal programs like Midnight Basketball around Cairns and... But this idea that you can't correlate the cost spent on that individual to money saved throughout the government system right. is where it's difficult to justify those. Martin, um, we saw the tragic deaths in Brisbane of Matthew Field and Kate Ledbetter on Australia Day, hit and killed by a stolen car, allegedly driven by a 17-year-old. Um, and that sort of, I th am I right, sort of accelerated the volume of the calls for a crackdown. And then you see as Michael referred to, that vigilante behaviour. So I don't know if people know, but there was, a, there was an innocent bystander, a 22-year-old woman uh, in Townsville, hit by a car that was allegedly following a stolen vehicle. Um, so it was a, a, allegedly a vigilante pursuit. Um, how do you see the scale of the problem, actually? Well, I mean, the scale... It is something that everyone talks about. It doesn't matter whether you're in Townsville or Cairns. People do want to talk about it all the time so perhaps it is magnified the problem is uh, enhanced I guess because people it is what they really want to talk about now those tragic incidences are just awful obviously and I don't think anyone's going to argue with that and what it says is that because people are willing to take matters into their own hands they're willing to become vigilantes it means they've had enough but I think people need to take a step back and, and, and as um, everyone here has pointed out, just take a step back and go back to the root cause and, and that is often, as has been said, the family at home and if, the, and if the environment at home, if you're not being engaged and disciplined at home, then, you're, then that's when you start going out. You know, and if I wasn't disciplined and engaged at home when I was that age, you know, chances are I probably would have been in all sorts of trouble myself. Mm. So I, I do think that as everyone's saying, we need to have a multi-tiered approach. But also, I, I don't have a problem with um, GPS trackers being put on recidivist offenders, people who've done this four and five times previously. I think they're the people that need to be targeted. And it's the other kids, the younger kids who are following them into these problems that 
they're the ones that we can get and uh, rehabilitate and make sure that we look after them, we re-engage them, whether they play basketball, mm. or whether we get them playing touch footy, or doing something else that will you know, knock the wind out of them, for want of a better term, mm. make them tired, go to bed at night, and they'll want to sleep. That's what we've got to do. We've got to get these kids having, having fun, and a fun that's not, you know, mm. life-threatening, dangerous, reckless behaviour. Yeah. Just a final one on this one, Samara. Um, do you accept that idea? The, the, the strategy seems to be if you can just knock out recidivist offenders, a small number of recidivist offenders, and, and, and there's almost a sense of you incarcerate them, and, and we know from the statistics mm. that once they're in that system, they're mm. likely to be trapped in that mm. system, they're likely to be back into that mm -hmm. system over and over mm -hmm. again, that then you can, you can deal and bring hope to the rest. Do you accept that? I think there's got to, it's, it's not just about knocking them out. You can't just knock out a crew and then that's it. Like, you know, that, oh, we've solved the problem, we'll focus on these mob here. There, there has to be, there has to be a really targeted approach on that collective. They've been identified, you know. We know that they've been identified here in Cairns, that, that they know who that, that small collective is. Um, but what supports are being put around them? And, and I say supports, but I mean like, you know, we need the intensiveness of, of multi-service approach, of, of making sure that these young people are having their, you know, their needs met and getting to the core, but, but putting them with people that can do that thing. You talk about the, the ability to pull back in line. Who is that for that, those kids? Because mm. it's not the police, and it shouldn't be the police. Um, that's not their role. It should be people in our community who have put their hands up um, to do that work, but they're not supported. So it it needs to be it. It's not the be all to end all. That's not the only way to do it. Uh, I think there are other models out there, and and we've we've certainly um, demonstrated that in mul in many different ways, even here in Cairns, um, from from volunteers, mind you, you know, who who put themselves at risk. Um, so what would, you, what would you do with a bunch of kids who are putting garbage bins in the middle of the street and trying to carjack somebody? Oh, genie weenie. That's, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, OK. It, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot of stuff. It's yeah. a lot of things that you've got to put around them. And, I'm, you know, I'm no expert in that. I, I know that... And I come from a leadership background, you know. It's that I come from supporting kids to take from there to, to excel. Yeah. But... You had a little look on your eyes then. I think you'd... Uh, be pretty tough on them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, but that's the thing. You have to have the, the relationship and the rapport with that cohort of kids in order to be able to pull them, them in back in line. Yeah. Do you think you could pull them back in line? Oh, look, I'm one of many people, um, but there are actually a whole cohort of, of people in our community that want to do that work um, and have the ability to work, do that work. Um, Is that a yes? But they're not supported. They're not funded. Mm. I mean, shh. I, I say sure, but I go, uh, we'll see. Yeah. You know, they give it a crack. If if mm. if we had the time to put the proposal together, sure, let's let's have a chat. Mm. Mm. You are watching the drama, and with me on the panel are chair and coordinator of Deadly Inspiring Youth Doing Good, Samara Jose, social inclusion specialist Topaz McAuliffe, owner of Blazing Saddles and former Liberal National MP Michael Trout, and station hand at Trafalgar Pastoral Company and former ABC journalist Martin Cudahy. It's a glorious sunny day here in Cairns, although we're strictly in the wet season. And while this time of year is usually quiet, COVID has just flattened this city's economy. Tourism usually generates $3.5 billion a year. And the industry estimates the region is currently losing, wait for this, $5 million a day. And as we've heard, around a third of the workforce are receiving JobKeeper, which is due to end in just over a month. Stephanie Bolchi reports from Tropical North Queensland. It's the same story all over, from the adventure park... Normally this time of year we'd be coming into Chinese New Year, for example, and uh, some of our attractions would be extremely busy. We're now seeing them operating on nearly 90% uh, less than what we had the year before. To the backpackers. When you walk in the kitchen, you smell different foods and you hear different languages and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And now that there's not so many people, it's, it's a bit quiet and lonely. To the hostel owners, this one's a million dollars in debt and has closed two of his eight. 
Normally it's a fairly successful business, but we're down to about 10 or 20% occupancies. Then there are the boats that just shouldn't be here in the middle of the day. Anchored at Cairns Marina, they should be out on the reef. One company has laid off 70% of their staff. About 70 kilometres north of Cairns is Port Douglas. 80% of the people here are in some way linked with the tourism sector. The bigger companies are hurting the most because they deal in high volume visitor numbers and probably a higher proportion of international travellers. And we're a remote destination. Aviation is key for people to be here. So the interstate market is most important to us. Intrastate, while it's, it's certainly helped us get through, it won't help us survive. But even small diving companies are running on empty, surviving on JobKeeper. We have gone broke oh, months and months ago. Either that or we'd have a debt that would make um, the nights very sleepless. We don't hold any bookings really beyond next week. <laughs> and that day-to-day -day, um, stress of not knowing whether you're going to be able to function beyond next week is sort of a challenge. We've had probably three trips now um, that have been cancelled. My wife did the matrix and worked out that the borders had only been open twice in the last 12 months. And one was for 19 days and one was for 15. And we're at about 16, so we had our fingers crossed that, that we'd make it up here. Nathan ran the LGBTIQ Hot and Steamy Festival on the weekend. But a quarter of the festival goers were from Melbourne. And last minute lockdown meant they were a no-show. He's had locals fill the gap, but it doesn't bring in any extra cash. But unfortunately, you know, we've lost that, um, that Victorian market who buy, spend money in the shops, they stay in accommodation, they go to the restaurants, they go out onto the reef. It's pretty bad. Um, it's, uh, you know, often we have, you know, weeks where there's no one in house um, mm. and that's, that's devastating. So where are the jobs? Mark Jackson used to be a baggage handler at the Brisbane airport. Now he's more than 100 kilometres from Port Douglas in Dimbula, sorting avocados. Because you have plans and, and um, they all just disappear on you, of course. Um, and this is something different and you, you're not sort of guaranteed all the continuity of work. So I am hesitant to go into state in case they get closed behind and I can't get home. For Kylie Collins, Recruiting the staff members has been a challenge and she's paying way above the award wage to entice them. I had something like um, 50 people all, all signed up, ready to go. You know, I've done all of my paperwork and everything. And then, you know, a um, couple of days before they were meant to come, um, they just didn't turn up. Some of them, the, the, they were in Victoria or they were in Sydney and they couldn't get up. Stephanie Bolci reporting there. She's uh, had a few days up here talking to a lot of locals. Michael, can I start with you? I want you to tell me the story of um, Blazing Saddles because there's a date in March last year that is actually emblazoned in your mind. What happened? Yes, yeah, certainly the 23rd of March last year was the last day that we've operated uh, our, our business and uh, we've been operating since 1990 and came in just after the pilot strike, uh, which was late, 80, late 80s. And, uh, we always, you talk to all the ones that have been around as, my, as long as I have, a bit longer, and they always talk about the pilot strike, what that did to the industry up here. It, it took out all aviation in, in the North Queensland. And when you look at Whit Sundays, Port Douglas and Cairns, uh, we are, truly rely totally on aviation for people to get here. The Atherton Tablelands and to the west, out to Undara and out to, uh, to Corumba and so forth, has a very healthy uh, tourism market, which is the drive market. So you've got the uh, retirees, the mm. grey nomads, uh, but also the people that love adventure and buy a four-wheel drive and have a caravan and take the family on a holiday. And they are usually people that are quite wealthy. They've been, they can afford a holiday, they can afford a four-wheel drive. So they are doing quite well. But here in Cairns, uh, we are the gateway to the Great Barrier Reef and also uh, to, uh, to the World Heritage Rainforest. And, when people come to Cairns, they don't think about horse riding or quad biking, but if they're here for a week and they see a nice brochure, and uh, particularly young people love those adventures, and mm. we've grown steadily over the last 30 years, and to just hit a precipice, and right now the staff are just feeding our horses, and uh, all my quad bikes have been serviced and sitting in the shed. So they're uh, all on JobKeeper? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's going to end 
at, at the end of the month? At the end, end, end of next month. So when they say to you, boss, what's going to happen at the end of next month, what do you say? They're quite nervous. A lot of them have actually started uh, applying for other jobs and uh, asking for, ref uh, for, uh, for myself to be a reference, a referee for them. And that's quite, uh, you know, it's a bit of a jolt because uh, th to think that, you know, maybe by mid-year we'll have the borders, you know, with the vaccine and so forth, uh, a lot more uh, um, ability that, that between the states there's a better cooperation that uh, people can fly here. And I could have a viable business going forward, but to have staff, to retrain them, mm. uh, today it's a very different day to 30 years ago where I could ring up and, and within a, a couple of days have four or five people that can ride a horse or a quad bike. That doesn't happen anymore. And, and uh, just to, to meet your compliance and everything else, uh, is something else, and so you so just can't turn it on and off. At, at, certainly at not, and and that's you know I've attempted to start restart our business two or three times already. Uh, last time was just before Christmas, and uh, now I've set my, my sights on Easter. But I'm still seeing okay. if there's going to be you know issues in Melbourne or in Victoria and New South Wales and Brisbane, and uh, so it's more realistically be the middle of the year. But uh, there's a gap, and even if I do reopen. It's we, we won't make any money. Yeah. It, it, it'll be myself driving the bus and riding the horses and yeah. so forth to stay alive. Topaz, I hadn't understood till I started um, uh, researching to come up here the nature of the industry. How much of this industry is international tourism, moving people around on buses and boats uh, from from overseas? What's the impact here in town? You're exactly that. The entire industry has been decimated. So everybody thinks about the boats going to the reef, but it is that. It's the transport, the coaches, the industry behind it that supports all that. It's just been wiped out. And so uh, people have been trying to do things differently. It's not like there hasn't been creative approaches, that people have pivoted, people have tried new strategies. Uh, but the reality is, is that there are so many other factors out of their control that if JobKeeper disappears, it will wipe out the industry. Mm -hmm. and the recovery of that, to Michael's point, and that retraining of people, it's not as simple as just turning it on and off. And so I think in a regional location where people aren't going to pack up and move, um, where there has been suggestion that that will take place, there's 150,000 people here who are locals that will not do that. So we have to think about what's going to work for the region. And if you're going to move everyone down to metro locations, how are they going to afford housing? What housing's available? So you mean move them down south? Yeah. South East Corner? Yeah, and that's what people are talking about. Well, they'll just move. They won't because they won't be able to afford housing because the same problem's happening everywhere. And so I think the paradise that Cairns has turned itself into with an amazing community, and not just Cairns, it's surrounding Tablelands, Port Douglas, all the areas, they're people's livelihoods that have been here for 30 years. It's not just here because of tourism. So I think it's really scary. Yeah. Uh, we heard earlier, Martin, uh, from uh, Alan Kohler, uh, saying, you know, 60,000 in the workforce, 22,000 on JobKeeper. Uh, if, if, if that is turned off at the end of the month, then Cairns, without assistance, is a ghost town or a retirement village. Does that sound a plausible future for this place? Well, no, I don't think it sounds like a plausible future, but at the moment that's, that's what Cairns is staring down the barrel of. So I think what needs to happen is there needs to either be some sort of further extension of that program or some other uh, program in place, perhaps targeted to businesses that can survive this. Because but how would be... you figure that out? Because it's not like the, you're covering the car industry, which was suddenly <laughs> deemed to be uncompetitive, and therefore you're looking at what they call structural readjustment, which is changing people's lives, relocating them, reskilling them. You've got an industry here that's competitive, that's efficient long term, and it needs assistance not because it's struggling long term, but because it's not. Well, I mean, it's. If you wanted to offer that targeted assistance, you're probably going to have to go through the books of every business that puts their hand up to, to stay on JobKeeper, and that's a huge ask for any uh, government to, to go through that, and that would cost you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. So I do think that there needs to be some sort of targeted approach to this to make sure that those businesses that can survive, as we hear a plane coming in in the background, if those businesses can survive, then that's great. Let's keep them going. Let's keep them afloat so they don't have to retrain as Michael said, so that they don't have to pivot their business towards a, a different angle. Because I guess the thing is, a lot of businesses in other areas could, uh, for want of a better word, pivot and take their model online. And they could sell what they were selling online. But tourism is a little bit different because you do have to come here and experience it. And that's what it's all about. So mm. 
oh, Kansas is really in a pickle and I think it's going to take some, sm some smarter people than me to sort it out. But I think that targeted approach early on, which might be resource and cost heavy, will actually solve things for the long run. So the businesses have already got their books open, they're already providing all of that to the government. I think for the amount of businesses that that would save, mm. I actually don't think that's a terrible scenario to look at because all the ones I've spoken to would be more than willing to try and figure that out. Mm. But if it's not wage related, you're not going to keep people in employment. And is that critical? Because you see, you look at Singapore, and they've just announced they're doing, they're going to continue to do payroll support for aviation and tourism. But I'm told if you look at Bali, you look at Phuket, you're, going to, you're starting to see those resorts and hotels run down. You know, nobody's painting, there's mould, you know, these boats all need upkeep. So what are you trying to mothball here, Michael? Are you trying to mothball, uh, you know, hotels, resorts, boats? businesses or or the workers yeah well workers are everything it, we, the, 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 tourism uh, the great thing about tourism when it comes to employment is the amount of people you need to employ uh, you know we have we have a relatively small turnover uh, in, in a small business but we employ 12 people so there's 12 families out there that that uh, while we're operating uh, can feed their family and raise raise a family and uh, enjoy a great lifestyle. So, so, that, so for you, is, is, is JobKeeper, an extension of JobKeeper, the simplest way to do this rather than a low interest or no interest loan or some sort of support absolutely. to your business? Nothing else is going to keep people uh, attached to uh, the company that they've been working for for a long time. And uh, when you've got a reef operator with 100 employees uh, and they're taking out 30 people a day, um, they, that, that, they're going to need something for the next two years, otherwise they'll have, they'll have if they've got multiple boats in that harbour there, they'll, have, they'll be back to one boat and uh, that's going to take a, a long time to come back. There's 10,000 rooms in North Queensland that we fill. Uh, two million people come through our airport. That's the sort of capacity we're talking about uh, that come to North Queensland and particularly to Cairns and Port Douglas. So mm. we, uh, I think that the government needs to get it loud and clear that we've got two years of, of real heartache in this town, uh, support us. We, we've been great contributors to the tax system and, and, uh, and a great place to come on holiday. Uh, believe in us, keep us going, keep us alive. Mm, mm. And, and they've got about a week to do it, I think, yes. mm. because you're going to have to put redundancy provisions Absolutely. in place. That, and that's the other issue, is that right. some companies, it's two months uh, out, before the, 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 they've already done their redundancies already. Okay. But uh, you, you did set right. Can I turn to you, Samara? I was, I was hearing that um, some of the boats here that'll take you out to the reef, they've all got together and said, all right, well, you go out Mondays and Tuesdays and we'll go out Wednesdays and Thursdays because we can't all afford to go out. How does that sound to you, the idea of the people that you know on JobKeeper for, for two years? Would they want to do that? Are they going to need diversionary programs? What do they need? Oh look, that's I think that's a that's a, a complex thing. You're trying to support multiple businesses, all trying to do service whatever's coming into Cairns. But is that enough for people? I mean, yes, you, you well your livelihood's taken care of, but if you've got enough to do, is it enough to fill you know, with that sense of purpose? The, well, that that's I think that's a big question for for the, our workers out there to to really consider for themselves. Mm. Um, you know, if we if we had longevity in terms of employment, then that's awesome. Um, but maybe there is a way that they can actually support some of the other things that can happen in our community. You know, there's there's really great opportunities to volunteer for for um, you know people who need support. Um, we need volunteers in in a, in a lot of our services, um, and we need consistent volunteers. And obviously, that's for us. That's a certainly hard thing for us to manage. Mm. Um, is you get people who want to pop up every now and again. Yeah. I'll do something good, but um, consistency is obviously the hardest things. Yeah. If the government wants to support people in JobKeeper to go out and do one day work because that's all that they can, you know, do or that's all that's needed, that then they come and volunteer for yeah. some other people <laughs> and some organisations. I mean, gladly take you. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> ring me up. Done. Doug, okay, so I just want to boast a little bit about the wonderful success that you had um, in leadership at Coles, where when you started there, I think there were 65 Indigenous employees, and when you finished there with the cooperation of that organisation, it was the largest Indigenous corporate employer in the country with over 5,000 workers and brilliant rates of retention. Something you said to me once was, if someone's a year out of work, if they haven't got a job, they're staring down the bar barrel of being unemployable. That, that, 
blew me away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, did you yeah. get that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think um, the the way that everything is set up is that essentially once you're out of the workforce for that long, you haven't been plugged in, or you've essentially just had you know 20, 30 interviews where you don't get any feedback as to why you didn't get the job. Just what that does to an individual, whether you're highly skilled or somebody who's yeah. coming out of high school, it's hard to come back from unless you've kind of got this additional support and access. But you've also in I think to understand the pathway to a job or employment that's out there as well. So before I worked at Coles, there was retail was never on anyone's agenda apart from let's yeah. just get it as a part time job. But yet the industry that that provides and pathways is just incredible. And I would encourage every person, yeah. young or old, if you don't know what you're doing, looking at retail Look as retail. An, a career. We're having some troubles with your mic and. Um and I think those clouds are coming in. This is the wet season in That's tropical it. North Queensland. Well, no trip to North Queensland is complete without checking in on the Great Barrier Reef. Climate change is its greatest but not only threat. Crown of thorns, cyclones and coral bleaching events also cause considerable damage, but scientists say not all is lost. Like everywhere, COVID-19 has disrupted plans to get out to the reef. Today, scientists are off to see how experiments on a cyclone-battered reef near Green Island are going. Coral fragments that would otherwise drift away and turn to rubble are being tethered to these steel reef stars. They are permanent structures. They're intended to be permanent. They'll be overgrown with coral and become part of the reef as well. So they're scrubbing off the algae to help that happen. The fish take over after around about two months and do the job for us. We're seeing that here, but I think there's a delay of about probably one to two months. More than three months ago, 165 specially designed reef stars were laid as part of a government funded test site. And we're comparing both where we put those stars in to stabilise the rubble and to with areas that haven't been stabilised. And we want to look at how the trajectory of those sites go over time to say whether we're really having a good impact. COVID-19 delayed this UTS team from coming to the site three times. Now they're finally able to gather samples of the reef. One PhD student is looking at the chemical makeup of the corals in different habitats. The other, how well they grow. Because we're putting corals on frames and the frames are made of a metal, we want to see if that has any effects on the health um, of the coral compared to the corals that are naturally found on the reef. So we know, for example, the iron, um, if it's too high or too low, can have a big impact on the health of the coral. There's another smaller clip to attach coral being trialled here too, designed by a local tour operator. Dr Camp says 85% have stayed on the clip in trials across the globe. It's a little clip that allows us to basically attach corals in all different orientations and eventually the coral grows over the clip and basically blends in. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority says both could be used as part of a larger toolkit. Say for example if a ship runs aground, how do we deal with that small area? And then if they're successful, we can then think about scaling them up. They're also hunting juvenile coral munching crown of thorns. Back-to-back -back coral bleaching in recent years has also substantially impacted the Great Barrier Reef, but there are positive signs of regrowth. That was reporter Stephanie Bolchi and camera operator Fletcher Young. Can you hear the rain belting down here in far north Queensland? It's wonderful. The wet season, hey? Well, all of this talk got us thinking, while the focus is on getting things back to normal, the way they were, what if you could do things a little differently here in Cairns? If overseas tourists aren't going to be the answer in the medium term and backpackers won't be back to pick the fruit, what changes could you make to reinvent cities like Cairns? And is it a chance to dig deeper to sort out the pervasive social issues? Ah. <laughs> It seems to me that you have changed your life uh, and a lot of people in this town are going to have to change their life and life's going to change. Talk to me about the change you made going from Kenya to Cairns and then to Charter's Towers. Well, um, I spent three years in, in Nairobi, based there as the Africa correspondent for the ABC and had some, some great times there, some exciting times and some pretty hairy ones as well. So. Um, when we came back, we didn't really want to go to a, a major city. We wanted to slow things down a bit because I was away a lot, three small kids, that sort of thing. So we came to Cairns and uh, had a great year here, really enjoyed that. 
but then an opportunity came to join my wife's family business. Now, they have a cattle station outside of Charters Towers, and uh, so we decided to reinvent ourselves, and I guess we were lucky in that regard that we had a link to the regions, so we could go there and uh, walk straight into a job, uh, but it was an industry I had to learn from scratch, and uh, probably tested my wife's family's patience at times, but it's been really rewarding uh, making that change, that's for sure, and I just think you need to have a go. You just, yeah, if, you, if, you're, if you're passionate about something, uh, a wise man once said to me, if there's dirt in your blood, you can't wash it out, and that's always been the case with me, you know, I've just, I just love being in the bush, and, uh, and so I had a real passion for it, and I guess that's helped me overcome uh, perhaps some of my other deficiencies. So what's a great day for you? What's a, what's a great day in far north Queensland for you? When it's raining like this, we're generally pretty happy because, uh, <laughs> because that means uh, the grass will grow. And uh, so, yeah, obviously we run a beef cattle operation, so um, it could be anything from mustering paddocks to building fences to uh, um, just, I mean, there's a whole range of things, to so fixing plumbing issues with pumps and that sort of thing. So. You've really got to be a jack of all trades and uh, learn a little bit about a lot of different industries to try and be uh, as um, as useful as possible. Yeah, yeah. Can you remember back, uh, Michael, to what a what a great day is for you in your business? Well, in what a great day was. I actually got a, uh, a message on Facebook uh, for the 20th on the weekend, and it was a young family from India, and um, the young lady was only about 15, uh, 18 at the time. Uh, she's now uh, in the World Youth Leadership, with, uh, an amazing girl, and anyway, she actually trained a bike, so her mother sent the photo and I said, well, she'll make a great leader, a world leader, but please don't go into racing cars because <laughs> that ain't going to work for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess my, the fun of being in tourism and being a small operator, uh, you do get to know uh, and talk to people for, for the the bus ride out, also the time you spend on the tour to take them back home. And uh, I do keep in contact with quite a few of those people. It's not, it's randoms that, that uh, you have a rapport with and, and uh, that's a great, great thing about tourism and uh, it's a bond that keeps you, keeps you wanting to do it. Mm. Do you miss it? I do, I do. And I, I still think we're going to get back there again. Uh, we're just going to need a little, bit of, a little bit of help along the way. But uh, uh, who, who knows, it could be the end of that chapter. But I'm still a little bit of a ray of sunshine to, up this rain to make sure it does happen. Yeah, yeah. So, Mara, it's, it's, it's interesting. They've got twin problems here in Cairns. You've got um, unemployment in the tourism industry, but the agricultural employers are desperate, desperate for workers. Um, something's going to have to change. Do you see opportunities in that? I mean, there are opportunities, but they come with, a, you know, a big life change. You know, you, you, the fact that you had to leave everything and sort of jump straight into something else. It's it's a big risk, you know, for a lot of people. But, I mean, if you have the heart for it, if you, if you need to do it, then, I mean, we just need to make sure that our community has got some support measures around them and that they can always reach back out for that help to go, if it's not working for them, mm. what does that look like, you know? How do we always make sure that we've always got some sort of fallback measure um, that can support people to, to be there. Not everyone's got dirt in their blood, you know, like the waves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Maybe yeah. it's rain, yeah. you know, or water, you know. So we know that for a lot of our young people, especially mobs that come from Torres Straits and things like that, that sometimes the best place for them is, is actually back at home, okay. back in the Straits, back on, back on the sea and the ocean, you know. Um, and that's where they belong, you know. But what does that look like and how yeah. do we support those people to be there? Yeah. There's possibilities, though. You know, we call um, Topaz this program the rainmaker because every time we leave the building, this is what happens. Yeah. Drought areas, this is what happens. Right. You're, you're the job maker. You're not the rainmaker. You're the, you're the job maker. Where do you see the possibilities? The, but particularly between that disconnect of workers needed, but big unemployment, social issues for Indigenous and low SES people of all, of all stripes, yeah. and a demand for workers. There's opportunity there. Yeah, so I definitely think that what is missing is collaboration. Um, it is definitely trying to happen, but there needs to be more coordination. There's individual services being delivered fantastically, but without them actually offering that end-to-end -end support, there's too many gaps where people fall through. And so I think that 
if we're looking at this as something that needs to happen, it's actually not rocket science. The solutions are there. Grassroots people understand how to do it. But year on year, when they're having to fight for funding, um, programs get broken, volunteers don't work. That's what the, that's what the challenge is. So. And so what does that look like? Because you know what that looks like over all that yeah. successful years in Coles. What, how, how do you find people jobs and keep them in jobs and keep yeah. them in careers? Yes, yeah, so I think that um, that perception, especially around Indigenous employment as well, that there potentially, when I started, wasn't enough Indigenous people out there who wanted to work. That was so far from the truth. I would have dealt with 10,000 people in employment in my time just working for Coles. And so it's actually just that connection, but also there is a bit of responsibility with the job seeker as well, that if you haven't got particular qualifications or you aren't finishing school, then you're limited to what your job choice is. You just have to be realistic that that's all you can do for now. I often see some kids get offered a plethora of choice when in reality, there's a handful of things you could do. So I think it's a two way approach, but I would say the amount of workers out there who are just so grateful to have employment far outweighs the group of individuals who aren't interested in working. Yeah. Does that sound right for you, Mum? Yeah, it does. I mean, if you want a job, I think, you know, you, you need to be prepared, as Topaz says, to start somewhere. It's a lot easier to find a job if you've already got one. Mm. So, I just, if you, if you really want a job, I do think you can find one, whether that's picking fruit or, you know, working as a concreter's labourer. Both jobs I've done, and they're not that much fun. But you know, it is it is money, and it, it's it's somewhere to start. Yeah, we got about we got about two minutes left on our show. What keeps you here? Your roots go back here tens of thousands of years. But what keeps you here, Samar? Um, you know, well, actually, my family is from Cairns, uh, from Charles Towers. Oh, right. Yes, but but for me, for Cairns, it's it's my connection to the far north. You know, yeah. I think. We have a beautiful community and, and there is so much potential in, in not just the lands, the seas, the waters, the airs. It, it's the people that genuinely make this a beautiful town um, and a beautiful community. We are the gateway to the Cape and the, and the Torres Straits and I think that brings so much um, potential and uniqueness to, to who we are and, and our region. So, I mean, I love it, I think, you know, you, you got, you've got to go from sunshine to, you know, storming <laughs> weather in a matter of, what, you know, half an hour. I mean, that's the beauty of, of, of where we live, yeah. you know. It's, um, it's unique. And you're never going to be able to find a place like Cairns yeah. that has everything that you need in a 20-minute drive. I go 20 minutes that way, I'm at a creek. <laughs> Don't bother me, I'm eating my mango, ripping it up, you know. Or I'm going that way and I'm going to the beach, you well, know. Like, that's why so many people like holidaying in yes, North Queensland. That's right. North that's Queensland. Right. We are out of time. Thanks so much to our panel, to Samara, Topaz, Michael and Martin. Have a great night. And Julia is back with you in the studio where it never rains in her face. Good night. <laughs>